Okay, let's get started. I guess the first announcement is I did compute midterm grades. If you had a zero, of course, on any quiz or Linux lab, zeros affect your grades in a very bad way. Um, not a problem. Just go back through and submit them. So when you look at your midterm grade, of course, if you see something that shocks you, it's probably because you had a zero there. For the students that have completed everything, I think everyone in here that has completed everything has an A or a B, okay, with maybe there might be one C. Um, so everyone's in great shape. This course, you just have to submit your coursework. If you have a zero, it's bad, okay? And I'm not taking off late points at this point should you have missed something and need to submit it still. So please go through and catch up. Okay, so we are on lecture module eight, which is networking. And we really, really get into, of course, starting to look at security and things like that right now. Um, so let's get started. Or excuse me, lecture module seven. My apologies is networking. If you would, please, can anyone either, either on your computer or on a piece of paper, I want you to write down four things. Because we need to, when we look at networking, there's some common concepts that we assess throughout networking. Okay, so let's let's get started. Network architecture. Can someone tell me what what do, what do architects in normal engineering you know design? What do they do? What do architects create? Okay, but more than that, really a blueprint. Okay, that's what we want to focus on. When we look at a network architecture, it's a conceptual blueprint. Defines the physical and logical components. And we saw that in operating systems, right? We have physical resources and logical resources. In operating systems, of course, I have a disk drive, physical resource. But the user stores a lot of files on there, and the file is logical. So we're going to have the same kind of concepts or same um, applications in networking. We have physical resources and logical resources in networking. When we look at a network, we assess it on four things. Fault tolerance, quality of service, security and scalability. We're going to go through these four concepts. And these, by the way, are not in the text, okay? You're not responsible. I'm not going to ask you for any, I'm not going to ask you any questions on a quiz about these four components, but it's actually crit a critical basis. You need to understand this to understand networking because that's the way we assess it. That's the way we look at it. Okay, so first, fault tolerance. Fault tolerance is the ability for a network or a system to overcome, well, it's, it, it ensures reliability, but to overcome failure. In computing, how do we achieve fault tolerance? Redundancy. I have two of something. Okay. Quality of service. In communications, different communication types require different types of quality of service, and we need to assess this. If I look at voice over IP, VoIP, okay, you know, the digital phone. Obviously, I don't want any delays in my conversation, right? I don't want dropouts. So I need a high quality of service for that. Same thing streaming, you know, audio, streaming video. I need a high level quality of service, web conferencing. In contrast, look at downloading a file. Do I really care if the file downloads in half a second versus a full second? Not really. And especially if you're a network designer, you know, you're saying they can wait. You're downloading a file, you can wait. I'm going to give the best service to those who need it. Conversations, streaming, things of this nature. Okay? So again, fault tolerance, quality of service. Those are the first two. Third is security. Security is critical. All of these things are critical. But security may be the most critical. We need to ensure confidence. Everything we do today is over a network. Think about e-commerce. Would you buy anything online if you didn't have confidence in the connection? No, e-commerce would be dead in the water. But it goes beyond that. In web design, I'm gonna tell you that anytime someone comes to your website, it's a transaction, equivalent to a business transaction. Why? They're giving you their time. Okay, so it's a transaction. So even for sites that aren't involved with e-commerce, security is critical because you need confidence to know that you're getting what you're seeking. What if you go to a hijacked site, right? 
I need to know, I need to have confidence in my network. So quality of service, fault tolerance, security. The last is scalability. How well can the network grow? How difficult is it to increase the nodes on the network, increase capacity, things of this nature? So we're gonna look at that. So please write down those four things. Again, quality of service, security, scalability, um, what did I say, fault tolerance. Because we're gonna assess everything we do in networking based on those four, those four concepts. Now, networking elements. Again, we can break networking down to four components or four critical elements. So first we have the communication devices. We have communication devices, of course, in our, in our end systems, our computers. How does our computer, what's the physical component in our little notebooks here that allows us to connect to the network? Does anyone know? Okay, so it's a network interface card. Yes, a NIC, okay? And we can be specific, we can say wireless, okay? But we also have, you might have ethernet ports, okay? So in that case, if you have both wireless and an ethernet, you actually have two physical addresses, two network interface cards. And I said something there, a, a physical address, because we're also gonna have a logical address. We're gonna see an IP address is a logical address, whereas a MAC, a media access control, address is a physical address. And at some point, we have to do that mapping. We have to map the logical to the physical. And I'll kind of get, I'll jump ahead here. We do this just with our phone conversations. Think about when you place a call from your home phone. What happens? You know, 227 something, 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 right? Of course, the phone that I have doesn't have a phone book, right? It goes to the head end, okay, or the central office locally. And that central office says, okay, here's a logical address, which was the phone number I just dialed, and it resides at this physical address. There's a mapping, because we know this. I know that if I move, I can take my home phone number with, it, with me, can I? Right, I can move, and if you, how many people still have home phones? Well, your parents probably still do, but you guys probably won't. Um, I know that I can move and have my phone number follow me which means that phone number is a logical address. Same thing if I were to call Los Angeles, you know, area code, some number. Of course, my head end, my local office here, doesn't have all the physical mappings of Los Angeles. It shouldn't have to. The call is forwarded to Los Angeles, and the Los Angeles head, head end station says, okay, that phone number is associated with this physical address, at some street address, okay? So we have this physical to logical, or excuse me, logical to physical mapping that takes place over and over, both in phone systems and in networking. And we're gonna look at this, okay. So we have the communication devices, physical addresses, um, and it's not just the end stations, I also have these intermediary devices out there in the network. I have routers and switches, okay, as these you know packets get switched around the network. Okay, two, might as well scroll down here, messages and their encodings. Okay, the messages are the units of information. They do a lot of things, um, you know, security, timing. Why timing? It is known that no two computers can be synchronized according to their clock. So I buy two identical computers. They're both 3.2 gigahertz, right? But they're not exactly 3.2 gigahertz, each, each machine. Little variations. It's impossible to coordinate or synchronize the timing of two computers because their quartz clocks are going to, or whatever the clocking mechanism is, are going to be slightly different. So how do we, how do we communicate? How do we synchronize? How do we have timing on a system? So I added this. So here is a, just a theoretical, a hyper, or excuse me, hypothetical clock on a computer system. And here's the data I want to transmit, 10100. Zero, zero, zero. But let's look at what happens if I can't synchronize clocks, okay? So say this is the, the sending data. One, clock, one system is sending this, 10100. Zero, zero, zero. But what if the receiving clock, the receiving system, its clock is just a little bit quicker, okay? So it's, say it would read a one there, okay? But it's, it's reading it again, a little clock cycle's a little quicker. So the next time it reads at the zero, it's a little bit closer to this line. So it reads the zero there. When it reads the one, again, a little bit closer to the line there, okay? 
you can see what's happening now because the second clock, its clock cycle is a little bit quicker, so it's shortened. So now when it comes to these two zeros, well, it samples, it reads a zero, reads a zero again, reads a zero again. So when I transmitted two zeros, the receiving destination, because its clock was quicker and there's no way to synchronize it, read three zeros. There's the error. How do we overcome this? I'm showing this to you because we need to constrain ourselves to thinking in a computing environment. How can we overcome this, okay? So what they first developed was Manchester encoding. And what they did is they embedded the synchronization into the signal. Obviously, I can't synchronize two clocks, so I can't just read one, zero, one, zero. But if I have a transition, because I can detect a transition, I can detect when it goes from you know, a 0.5 voltage to a zero voltage. I can, I can read that transition at the end station. So we embed it. So now to encode the information, I'm going to use a transition. So in Manchester encoding, a transition from high to low is a one. Transition from low to high is a zero. High to low, one low to high, low to high. So this is going to be mid-cycle. So now the end station can sit there and say, when is that transition? And is that transition from low, 0.5 volts as an example, to zero or zero to 0.5 volts? So I'm embedding the sig I'm embedding the encoding into the signal itself. And that's the way we can get timing into the signal. So I don't have to worry about synchronizing the clock on two computers. Okay. So what do we have here so far? We have the communication devices, we have the encodings, the mediums. Okay, how is the signal actually transferred? Now, I'll tell you right, I'll tell you right now, um, the book is incorrect, but you're responsible for the book. Um, when we look at mediums, what do we have? We have wireless, we have copper cable, you know, whether it's DSL or coaxial cable, and we have fiber optic. The book will say that we only have two. The book will say we have wired and wireless. So what it's doing is it's throwing fiber optic cable in with wire, okay? In every other textbook that you will ever read or any other academic journal, fiber optic cable is not a wire, okay? But, but for the purposes of the quiz, okay, according to the textbook, there are two. There's wired and wireless. So we'll look at that. And when we look at the mediums, when we look at the mediums, again, we assess them on those first four components. What's their fault tolerance? What's their security? their scalability and quality of service, right? Because fiber optic is gonna, its quality of service is gonna go through the roof. Reliability, things like this, fault tolerance, okay? We're gonna assess this. Lastly, protocols. Protocols are the rules for exchanging messages. And we, we use, we have rules for communication all the time. In a phone conversation, our phone conversations, we have, we have rules. If the other person is speaking, we try not to speak. And it's very sometimes difficult to under, or know when the other person is done speaking, okay? So what do you do? You know, the other person's speaking, I think they're stopped, or maybe they did stop, and I start to speak, and they start to speak, okay? Maybe I'll back off. And this is one of the protocols that we're going to learn about today. When I talk about networking, quite often I use the example of our road system, okay? I have, we have the physical road system out there, right? We have highways, streets, all of these things. That's the infrastructure. But I also have all these rules of the road, right? I can take a red on red, I stop if there's a red light, all these other protocols. So you can actually look at networking in a very similar fashion as our highway system. Okay, so those are the four things I wanted to introduce. They're not in the textbook, okay? When we assess a network, we assess it for quality of service, fault tolerance, security, and scalability. And again, looking at networking, we can kind of break it down into a few different things. We have the communications devices, we have the encodings, we have the protocols, and we have the mediums. And that's it. Once you have those you know, separate groups of four things down, it's actually really, networking is very straightforward, it's very easy. So let's take a look into chapter seven. Okay. So a lot of this, again, is common sense. What's a network? connected system, okay? What's a computer network? Connected computers, okay? Very straightforward, and that's it. One thing, computer networks are converging, okay? And when we look at networking, um, and actually a lot of things, if, if things are converging, quite often we break them down to their base system, 
okay? Because we're gonna look at, we have digital systems and analog systems. Well, why did we have analog? The old phone, okay, the fo old phone system, POTS, plain old telephone service was analog. But now we can use digital communications. We can break it down and transmit digitally, where it's going the other way, digital to analog doesn't really work. So now everything's converging, bless you, onto a digital system. Um, and we'll look at that. Okay, so the Internet's the largest computer network in the world. We know that. Telephone service, plain old telephone service, POTS. Okay, you'll still see that. Um, by the way, anybody here expect looking to go into networking? Um, networking kind of is the basis of security. So if you're thinking security, you're going to need some some net, uh, quite a bit of networking knowledge. Um, networking is one of the few disciplines that can't be outsourced, okay? Especially overseas, right? Web design, database work, all of these things can be done around the world. You can work, you can program with someone in India right now. But when you look at a network, quite often it requires on-site configuration and management. So just just something something to think about there. Um, mobile phones, I'm not going to say much about. Um, cellular phones, dual mode phones. Here's an interesting thing here. Okay, interesting to me. Um, we look at the recall. With everything we do, we look at the business, IT, um, society triangle. And dual mode phones, of course, is the ability for, say, your cell phones to use both a cellular network and a Wi-Fi network. And an interesting piece of history here with the iPhone and why the iPhone succeeded or how it succeeded. Back when the iPhone was conceived, um, Steve Jobs was pitching this to the cell phone companies and nobody was really on board with it. Um, AT&T at that point was, was far, beyond, far behind Verizon. And Steve Jobs went to AT&T and he said, well, we'd, I'd like to do this. And ATT said, you know, saw the possible sales and said, no, that'll, that'll crash our network. We'll have too many users, nobody will have bandwidth. Okay. But Steve Jobs was able to convince them, well, it's a dual mode phone. So when the users are within Wi-Fi range of something, they're, they're not going to tax your system. They're going to use Wi-Fi. And AT&T saw this of like, hey, here's a chance that we're going to sell a lot of phones. We're going to have a lot of money coming in to build towers to catch up to Verizon. And this is actually what took place. So it was actually the negotiation. It was actually business that made the iPhone succeed. It was Apple, Steve Jobs, being able to go to AT&T and say, hey, listen, this is going to be mutual, mutually beneficial. Okay, um, So kind of an interesting thing. Um, and of course, the iPhone succeeded. Satellite phones are great, very cool, if you can afford one. Um, I'm a sailor. I would I would love to have a satellite phone. <clears throat> um, television, radio, broadcasting. Um, when we look at broadcast, there's something implicit in the word broadcast. Okay. First of all, there's a mathematical relationship there because we're going to look at networking. When we look at broadcast, what do we look at? One to many. Okay, that's the relationship. Also, it's one directional, and we we'll, we look at again. Historically, the dot-com crash, the early 2000s. Internet blew up, you know, people were making tons of money. And what they thought was that with the web, that it would just be another broadcast mechanism. I'm going to create this web page, I'm going to put it out there, people will come to my site. That's not what people wanted. They didn't want another broadcast mechanism, just like radio and television. And a lot of companies went belly up. Um, so we'll look at broadcasting. It is still used in networking. We'll look at broadcast, you know, um, multicast, the peer-to-peer. -peer. GPS, global positioning system. And again, the textbook now is really just going through, it's kind of listing all of these networking technologies. Um, one of the things that we need to understand is GPS, especially with cell phones, it's not true GPS, what the cell phone, many, most of the cell phones are using. They're using a triangulation from the cell phone towers, okay? True, of, true GPS, of course, is using the satellite system. Um, there are third-party dongles that you can add to both iPhone or Android that actually have GPS chips in them. One is, um, I think it's called the Bad Elf. Um, so again, if you're a salesman out in North Dakota, you know, there are no cell phone towers. But if you still need directions, because of course, if you're not seeing any cell phone towers, your, your um, navigation isn't working, 
get one of these and you'll actually have true GPS or buy a phone with true GPS. Um, does anybody know? Anybody here have a phone with true GPS? You'll have to research that maybe. No idea. Um, I'd research it um, because again, if you're doing any like boating, especially Lake George, Lake Champlain, things like that, there's so many dead areas. Monitoring systems. And here's where we really start to ass start assessing these things too. RFID-based systems. And we'll actually come back to this in security. Um, RFID, it's wonderful, okay? Great applications, great uses. uses. Um, many security concerns here though. Um, next week we're gonna start talking about the Internet of Things, where our, in the next 10 or 20 years, our environment is just gonna be filled with sensors. And they're tracking us now, we're being tracked, we're gonna be tracked even more in the next 10 or 20 years. And it is cause for concern. Um, I'll give you one example with RFID. Great, great uses. Um, out in California, they're putting RFID chips in, you know, I think the corks of wine bottles. Um, so when you, in certain stores, you add a wine bottle to your shopping cart, it gives you the wine speculator report. Um, you look at automated checkouts. Or with a shopping cart, you put items in your cart, it automatically tallies what your total is. So you know immediately how much your shopping cart, what you're gonna have to pay at checkout. You know, you can put things, items, items back, add things. So you kind of have this running tally. Great. Um, RFID, Walmart is using it a lot. Um, it puts them in their pallets. So they know, you know, a pallet of lettuce. They know exactly where it is. And it gets stuck in a snowstorm in the Midwest. Well, suddenly, they realize, well, you know, that lettuce has like a two-day, you know, shelf life left. There's no way it's making it to Maine. But what they're able to do is reroute it. Okay, we'll just send it to a local store here, have a whatever they call their red dot special or whatever, and blow it out at half the cost. At least they recoup some of their money. So it is helping business. Getting back to the security component, um, a luggage company, really high-end luggage company, started putting RFID tags into their luggage. Who was it targeted for, you know, not, not me, you know, people with tons and tons of money, chauff who have chauffeurs, things like that. Because they can put their luggage, it just comes out on the carts, of course, they don't have to be there. Their chauffeur can just stand there with an RFID reader, oh, that's ours, that's ours, that's ours. Great. But thieves quickly learned of this. Because now they could walk through an airport with an RFID reader and go, oh, that's one of those pieces of luggage. Why would they do that? Well, the luggage itself was going for like $1,500 a piece. But if you can afford to buy a suitcase for $1,500, what do you think's in that suitcase? Okay? So it made it very easy for thieves to just walk through an airport. Oh, there's one right there. Grab that bag. Grab that bag. Um, so again, great intention. But of course, anything we design can be subverted for ill purposes. Um, GPS monitoring systems, we're gonna look at this in depth. Again, um, the Internet of Things is coming and there are some major security and privacy concerns. Um, okay, um, anybody running home networks, streaming media and stuff through your home? No, running a home server. Um, it's actually a possible final project. I've had, it's, I don't put it there because you, you need to buy like a uh, Raspberry Pi unit or something like this, um, which are like 20 or $30. But students have done this in the past. It's actually not that difficult if you want to set up a streamer in your, in your house to stream content around it. Um, if you do go out and buy, say, a network attached storage and you want to do streaming, just make sure it's DLNA compliant which is the Digital Living um, Network Association, because this will allow you to stream it. There are a lot of NAS network, attack, network, boy, network attached storages out there that do not support this. Um, so again, if you, if you want to do this, just make sure you buy the right one. When we start streaming around the house, let's go back to you know, earlier chapters, make sure it's in the right format too. Certain devices, you know, Apple iPads, things like that, don't really support like the .avi format. So if you're looking to airplay it to your Apple TV, things like this, um, you have a few, few other hoops to jump through. So you may or may not want to do that. Telemedicine is going to be huge, okay? The ability, and we, and we saw some of that, um, you know, getting into virtual reality, things of this nature. But again, 
what is really important for telemedicine? Quality of service, right? I better have the bandwidth. Security, I don't want someone hacking into my system while I'm, someone's doing surgery on me, um, you know, remotely, or at least leading them through my surgery. So again, we have to look at those, with everything we look at here, look at those four components, quality of service, reliability, security, and um, scalability. Okay, here we go. Bandwidth. What the textbook will not tell you, or does not put in these words, bandwidth is the inherent capacity of the medium. Okay? And we're going to look at mediums. You know, we're going to look at copper cable. But even within copper cable, we're going to look at, say, twisted pair, you know, what that Verizon uses for its DSL, or coaxial that is used for your cable TV. And we know that the cable TV cable is much thicker, right? It's going to have a higher bandwidth, which means it has a higher inherent capacity. And this is one of the reasons why Time Warner will always be faster than Verizon's DSL. Verizon will keep pushing that envelope, getting faster and faster on those two little twisted pairs that are a telephone line. But the inherent capacity of the uh, coaxial cable that Time Warner uses just larger. So what Time Warner does essentially is throttles its signal. It's always going to remain just a little bit ahead of Verizon. So when Verizon has its next technical breakthrough and increases its speeds, all Time Warner has to do is in software say, okay, turn that switch, let a little more through. So Time Warner will always say 1.5 times faster than DSL. And, and there's nothing Verizon can do about it because the inherent capacity of that thicker coaxial cable is higher than twisted pair. Yeah. So why would time warner not just turn it to a point where no one could possibly reach? Money. Right? You want faster? Buy pay for extreme. And we're gonna look at um, net neutrality. Is anybody familiar and keeping up on net neutrality? Um, interesting things taking place. Um, with what the F FCC was going to, they were looking at legislation to allow, say, the, the major carriers, Verizon, AT&T, things like that, to open up channels and have people pay more for it. Um, in a nutshell, net neutrality means, or, the, or the, the concept, is that all traffic, all information out on the network should be equal. Um, and Time Warner, Verizon, Comcast, they don't want that. Okay, and why? And I see, I see their perspective. You look at companies like Netflix, right? How does Netflix make its money? Streaming movies, but do they own the roads? Essentially, the internet infrastructure. No. Who does? Verizon, Time Warner, you know, um, AT and T. So I see that. But net neutrality. In the past, some of these companies have throttled information. In Canada, I think it was. I think it was Comcast, and someone can correct me. Um, of course, these major companies, Time Warner, they have their own digital phone service, right? So they don't like Skype, because Skype just uses their system. Up in Canada, Comcast was throttling Skype, which means they would inspect, of course, the, the headers and trailers, see that it was a Skype message, and, and deprecate it or, or lower its quality of service. So if you're using Skype, you know, you would not get a good connection. Well, I want good connection, so I'm going to pay Comcast for their digital phone. Um, and if we didn't have these, 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 this net neutrality legislation, these companies would be able to do this. Okay, Netflix would get poor quality. You'd have to get your streaming movie stream from, say, Time Warner. Um, so we'll look at that too. So again, bandwidth is the inherent capacity of the medium. I want to reiterate: it's measured in bits per second. Okay, here's where that attention to detail, lowercase bps, right? Whereas we know that a byte is a capital B. And when we work with file systems, we're dealing with bytes, file sizes. You know, how many bytes is it? Um, so just remember that, and of course, a byte is eight bits. Um, analog versus digital signals. Well, we know an analog, okay? Um, it's continuous. Something interesting here about continuous, of course, continuous signals offer more precision, especially when it comes to audio, right? When I convert, digitize an audio signal, we saw that I'm actually going to have some loss, right? It's, it, it's, a, it's only going to capture it at discrete levels. So I'm going to have some loss. And that's why, you know, audiophiles love, you know, the old LPs. 
Okay. So, transmission type and timing, serial versus parallel. On the internet and in networking, we use serial transmissions, one line. Inside a computer, of course, it can be parallel. In some, you know, real high-end um, storage systems, you may have parallel connections. Why would we do that? Recall what I said, we, when we look at converging technologies, quite often we look at a base system. I can give you an analogy, you know, if, uh, if you're um, adding two fractions, one-eighth and one-sixteenth, what do you do? You convert the eighths to sixteenths, right? Lowest common denominator. Well, if I look at it on the internet, there's no way to know, there's, there'd be no way to design a system, because some people would connect using eight, eight lines, 16 lines, 32, 64. You couldn't manage it. What happens if you have 64 pathways, but the next link in the system is 32? You could never manage that. So what do we do? Serial transmissions, OK? One line. So lowest common denominator, and it works. So the internet is serial and data is sent one bit at a time. Synchronous transmissions. <clears throat> now, the way the book presents this is a little, let's say, misleading. And again, you're responsible for the book's definition, OK? Blocks of data transferred at regular specified, OK? But there's no way for an end station to know precisely when that communications is coming in. And there's something else that's implicit in synchronous transmissions that the book doesn't really talk about. If I'm going to have synchronous transmissions, I need to set up a connection between the two devices. Think about this. Your phone conversation on a cell phone is essentially synchronous, right? You call someone, they pick up, sets up a connection. And then you speak, they speak, etc. In computing, what does it take to set up a connection? I'll give you an analogy. It requires a three-way handshake. And I'll present this from Cisco's standpoint of two astronauts in space. Think about how they, what they have to do to set up a connection. Okay, so um, Betty, this is Tom. Do you read me? Okay, two astronauts are out in space. They can't see each other. And one party will initiate the connection. Betty, this is Tom. Do you read me? And what's implicit in that signal? I used a destination address and I included my source address. So those are two necessary components. And what do we know about the system? Or more importantly, what do the parties know about the system at this point? Tom sent a message to Betty. Does Tom know if Betty received the message? No idea. OK, so Betty responds. Hi, Tom. This is Betty. I read you. OK, now what do we know? Well, Tom has sent a message to Betty. He knows that. Betty has now received a message from Tom and sent a message back to Tom, but Betty doesn't know if Tom actually received her second message there. It's not until the third part of the handshake where Tom responds to Betty, hi Betty, yes, this is Tom, I read you loud and clear as well, okay? So setting up a connection, as soon as we talk about synchronous transmissions in a computing system, computer network system, requires a three-way handshake. One party initiates it, the second party responds, but it's not until the first party responds to the second party that both parties know that the connection is established. So it requires a three-way handshake to set up a connection. Yeah. Um, what, what the four-way handshake? Well, it's not necessary. There, there are other parameters that are, that are passed here, and we're actually going to look at that, of, of more of the information that's transferred because you'll set up synchronization, you set up window sizes, you'll set up like encodings, is this going to be encrypted, okay? Um, so other things can be added as, as you go along. Good question. Um, so again, synchronous transmissions requires connection management. Okay, in contrast, asynchronous transmission is just data that's just sent out. Okay. And we actually saw one type already that uses asynchronous, broadcast, right? Broadcast, I'm just sending it out there. Radio station, sends it out. Does it have any idea who's listening? Okay. Um, asynchronous transmission broadcast is still used in computing. 
because there are many network messages that just need to be broadcast onto a network, okay? Isosynchronous, data sent at the same time at regular intervals, but again, don't be misled. There's no way for the end stations to know exactly when it is coming, okay? They just know it's coming. They don't know when it's coming, okay? We need to understand the difference between simplex, half duplex, and duplex. Simplex, simplex one direction only, broadcast. Half duplex, one direction at a time. You can think of the walkie-talkies, you know, we, we probably all played with. When you depress the send button, you can speak, but of course, you can't hear anything. To hear anything, you have to let go of the button on the walkie-talkie, okay? So that's half duplex. Full duplex, communications both directions at the same time, concurrently. Full duplex, of course, is going to be the most complex. Okay? because I'm going to need more protocols, just like the phone conversation, right? When I'm speaking or when the other person's speaking, I don't interrupt. If we're both just speaking at the same time, well, you know, you may be able to understand what's going on. But full deep, so as soon as we go to full duplex communications tr transmissions, I'm going to have a higher complexity. Okay, circuit switching and packet switching. And let's see, how am I doing on time here? Uh, make it through this and we'll take a little break. Okay. Circuit switching. Circuit switching, I establish a dedicated path over the network. Whereas packet switching is what takes place on the internet and what really what takes place for all networking because really we use TCP IP um, networking and I'll introduce that in just a minute. Broadcasting of course is sent out to all nodes on a network. So let's take a look. So here's my circuit switch network. Um, now again, there are a couple things now, let me do this first. So circuit switch, I actually establish an end-to-end -end path, dedicated path. Obviously, if this is used for, say, VoIP, voice over IP, something like that, I'm wasting bandwidth because there, there are times when I'm not speaking or the other person's not speaking, there's just dead air, but yet I have retained this path, so I, it may not be the most efficient. In contrast, and we're going to look at this, this will become more apparent when we when I discuss the uh, TCP IP protocol stack. In packet switching, the messages are broken up into separate equivalent size packets. And the packets are routed independently. So each packet may take a different path between source and destination. Now this will induce some complexity on the end station's behalf because now they're going to have, when they're getting these packets, they may arrive out of order, so it may have to order them. They may not arrive at all, so they may have to request a retransmission. And we'll take a look at this as well. And broadcast, of course, is a one-to-many single directional. But take a look at this too, because I, I said we have to assess everything based on quality of service, you know, security, scalability, um, fault tolerance, okay? Fault tolerance, if this path goes down, I have to set up a new connection, okay? So I'm looking at the circuit switch network where I'm moving my cursor here. If that path goes down, okay, obviously it's not too fault tolerant. Whereas in a packet switch network, there are many different paths that the sender can send a packet to the recipient. Now, it may have to resend it, individual packets, but still. How about security? This one's huge, okay? Security in a circuit switch network if I have someone just camped out on that node in a circuit switch, they're getting all communications. Everything is going through that node, that intermediary. So in that sense, a circuit switch network is inherently less secure than a packet switch network, right? Packet switched, I have someone who's trying to read eavesdrop sitting out camped out on this node. Okay, well, they're, they're getting these packets, but the packets that take the alter, alternate route, they know nothing about, okay? So a packet switch network, by its very nature, is going to be more secure. And this is actually one of the problems that, of course, the, you know, the um, Department of Defense, NSA, they wanted to eavesdrop on all cell phone conversations. Well, cell phones have gone to a VoIP digital system, right, packet-based. How do you capture them when these packets are going all over the place? The only, the only place to actually capture all the packets is at the source or the destination. Okay? So... Um, what else? So we have fault tolerance, scalability, doesn't really come into play here when we, when we assess this. OK. 
Okay. Um, so tell you what, I'm going to take a real quick break here. There's there's a lot of content here, so I don't want to. I know I know put people to sleep anyway. Um, so I have quarter of. Let's pick it back up at five of nine. So if you want to take a break, take a break. <laughs>